peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A fascinating parable. As God, as uh, Jesus is, uh, as it says, is addressing it to his disciples. But there are others there. It's in the co greater context. We had the uh, uh, last couple of weeks. We've been looking at the parables in the previous chapter, uh, Luke chapter 15. But this one is particularly a problem because, or people look at it and it says, uh, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness, for his, the way that he very shrewdly mishandled the master's estate and properties and money and stuff. And, and people, as it says at the end, the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed Jesus. They ridiculed him. They made fun of him because it certainly didn't make sense to them. They made a show of doing everything up front and perfect. They dressed right. They lived right. They worshiped right. They, and on and on. They did everything just right. The problem was is that they weren't. See, this is in the context, that, and this particular parable, a lot of people have trouble with it. In fact, that's my understanding. I heard in, uh, from good sources that uh, many pastors just kind of skip over. They deal with the uh, epistle lesson or the Old Testament lesson or combination thereof and sort of ignore this one. But they're missing a great opportunity for a fantastic stewardship sermon. So here you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Not really. The, uh, the parable. Uh, the expert on Jesus' parables, particularly of the loss, is a man, uh, Dr. Kenneth Bailey, who died some three years ago. And he spent his life in the Middle East teaching and studying and, and, and researching uh, the background on the parables of Jesus. So to help us understand exactly what was going on and what the process was. And, and he had, this one, uh, they, there was a series of five lectures that he, that he gave or interviews, and this was the last one. They saved this one to last to talk about. But he sets forth to help us understand what the situation was then. And there was a master who had great estates, and he had this manager of his estates, at least of the agricultural aspects of his estate, handling all the, uh, the grains and crops and stuff that were growing, and, and working with the, those who had uh, rented the land and then were expected to pay a portion of their, uh, of their proceeds, of their crops, uh, back to the master. Except that, apparently there was some problem because some other people, doesn't say specifically who they were, whether they were stewards of other parts of his estate or whether it was whoever it was but there were several complaints to the master they complained about it. he said that he is mismanaging he's mishandling your estate and your affairs in other words your money he's mishandling it and so the master didn't do any research their word was convincing enough and so he called this this uh, steward, this manager, uh, before him. And they said, and he said, what is this I hear about you? And what a silly question. You know, that's a perfect question. Because whatever the man says, if he tries to justify himself, if he tries to give excuses, not knowing what the master actually heard, but tries to excuse that, he's going to dig a hole deeper because he doesn't know if what he's talking about and trying to excuse is what he heard, the master heard. And so, being a shrewd man, he said nothing. And then the master said, you are no longer a manager. Go 
and bring the books and settle up. In other words, you're fired. And so let's close out the accounts. And you heard the steward's thinking. He says, what am I going to do? I says, I, I, <laughs> I don't have the strength to dig ditches. And I'm too ashamed to beg. And then he got an idea. Very shrewd idea. Even his master came to recognize it. We don't know what it is when it starts. But this is what he did. You heard. What he did was, he called each of his master's debtors. Privately, he brought them in and he said, how much do you owe? He had it right there. Look at it. But he wanted the man to tell him, how much do you owe? He said, how much do you owe? And he said, one of them was a hundred measures of wheat. And then he said, here. Take your bill, your IOU, and sit down quickly and, and write 80 and give it back to me. And so he did that. And I said, oh, man. And, and so the, the, the people are, are you know, they're, they're, oh, by the way, there were various amounts, but all of them, according to Bailey, all of them equal a year and a half of, of daily wages. Uh, the, the denarii was the daily wage. That's how much a Roman soldier made each day. And so he released them from a year and a half's wages for one of their servants in carrying things out. And, uh, and this, he, his, his thought was, he said, you know, now when I am, since I can't, <laughs> I, I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm too ashamed to beg, uh, maybe they will receive me into their homes, into their houses for a time frame, and with all the people that he did with, uh, that he, his master did business with, he'd be going around and around the community a lot, for a long time before he had to find any other kind of work or whatever. But at the same time, see, he did it one at a time before anybody found out that he'd been fired as manager. And not only that, see, all of these guys that have been released from such a major part of the of their debt, and in the case of the wheat, 20% discounted. Okay. And, and they go home and they think, what a great master. Look at the tremendous discounts. He is so generous. He is so caring. He's such such a benefit to us, <coughs> concern for us, and so forth. <coughs> and uh, so the, now the, as each one goes out and starts spreading the news of, of this great benefactor for the community, as the master is writing off 20% of everyone's debt to him, <coughs> and they're thinking, wow, this is, this is fantastic. And so finally, when he's gone through everybody, <coughs> and, uh, boy, sorry. I don't want to quit talking, though. Uh, as, he's, as he goes through, and, and he collects all the books and all the papers, and he goes back to his master, and he presents the books to them. And the master, at this time, knows he's heard, and he sees what he has done. And he commends them for his shrewdness that he has figured out a plan how to provide for himself when his job is done. And it was done. It's finished. And the master said, how shrewd. And then, because Jesus' comment on it was, his commentary was, that the uh, children of men, the worldly people, are so shrewd at getting things done. Because you know, as it was with the manager, his stuff was illegal. I mean, if the master had found out, if the news had gotten around that he was fired, and then he was doing all this shenanigans, he'd have been jailed for the rest of his life. And so now the, the master has a conundrum. He has a real problem. 
because there's only a few ways that he can go with this. He can say, that's bad, you're going to jail, and I want all my money back. Which means he's going to have to go to all those people who thinks he's so magnificent, he's so beneficial, he is so giving, and all of a sudden he's going, he going to get this stuff back? The manager knew that he was a giving man, that he was a beneficent one. He gives good things to the people that he does business with. And he was banking on his not ruining his newly grand celebrated reputation by taking all that money back. And that's not what he did. He just commended him. And, and commended him for his shrewdness in taking care of things. Now, as we so often as Lutherans say, when we've had a statement, and our response is, this is most certainly true. And what does this mean then? Which is what I was supposed to say. But anyway, what does this mean? Who's the master? God. Who is the unfaithful, mishandling steward and managers of the master's estate? We are. We are. God has given us gifts in life, time, talents, treasures, all sorts. Every good thing comes from God. And as his children, his anticipation is that we are faithful managers of what he gives to us. But we lie, cheat, and steal because that's our sinful nature. We're still in the flesh. But God says, this is my property. I have loaned it to you to manage for me. And you messed it up. You, you selfishly used it for your own benefit. You Way beyond, well, okay. But what it says was, he was so beneficent and so merciful that he gave the greatest gift of all to his unfaithful steward, which was he not only forgave him his sins, he commended him for thinking of the right way to go about while he still had control of the properties that he managed in order to establish something, uh, a place for him when the job was over. Okay. What is when the job is over for us? Death. Death. And you have been fired. You, we all are dying. And God says... Show me the books. How are you managing all the good things that I have given to you? How are you doing with that? And we have to come to the confession that we've messed up. We have not been managing God's gifts to us as perfectly, as completely for his glory and the extension of his kingdom as almost maybe partly as much as we use those things for our own glory, for our own extension, for our own benefit, for our own comfort, for our own in time. But what Jesus said was, is that God gives us the management so that we will be received into the eternal mansions we don't use and manage his goods in order that we might go to heaven. But we manage the gifts that he gives us because we're going to heaven. 
And it doesn't belong to us, and we understand that. We under, come to understand by God's grace and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we come to realize that we are sinners. We are mismanaging the Master's estates, His good gifts to us. But we come to Him in prayer. That's a, what a friend we have in Jesus, of course, to take everything to Him in prayer. We take our, when we recognize that we are mismanagement, when we recognize that we have failed in our duties, when we recognize that we're not letting the Holy Spirit guide us and strengthen us by word and sacrament to be the children of God that God has called us to be, call us out of the world to go into the world as His emissaries, as His managers of all the gifts that God places into our hands. And, and that's what Jesus says, you can't serve the world and God at the same time. That unfortunately is precisely what too many who profess to be Christians today are exactly what they're doing. They're going by the political correctness understanding of, of, of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Are they accomplishing any of that? No, it all fails. Miserably. Miserably. Because that's what the basis of our sinful flesh is all about. Is that selfish nature. And what God says is, that's not why I made you my children. I made you my children so I would have faithful managers for my good gifts to you. To use them to, one, available to support the ministries of the congregations, the churches, the organizations that of God. To reach out to help people with the gospel and to meet their physical and other needs. And that's what I expect of you. And and a willingness, a, a, a commitment to that. As in the offerings, one of the offertories is that, that we sing following. You know, we present our offerings to the Lord as a representing our total giving to God of our whole lives that all belongs to Him anyway. And this is just a portion of that time, talent, and treasures that is, is all from God. And God says, I will help you. Let me give you instructions as, as you try your own methods and find out, mm, no, that may be shrewd, but it's not, not only illegal, it's not helpful, and there's too much collateral damage. So let's try it my way for a change. Let me help you do that. And he sends us the Holy Spirit to help us do it God's way with God's estate. It's all God's, and we're his managers of everything. That was in the perfection of the Garden of Eden. That's what Adam's job was. Helped by Eve. And, and oh, there's some, there's some challenging texts in Timothy today. Did you see the, the here Ruth? I don't think there's any gender confusion. She's a woman. And she was speaking from the chancel the words of God. Paul says, you can't do that. Women not supposed to teach. That's the order. And it really caps it off by saying their fulfillment is in childbirth. It was for Eve because she bore the seeds that bore the seed, carried the seed for the Christ child. We carry Christ in us. And as the priesthood of all believers, we all are priests. We're all serving, sacrificing, living for other people. That's the fulfillment for each of us. Some of us are called by the priesthood of all believers, called to public office. And 
The Missouri Synod passage for all time, 500 years, has been everything done decently and in order. And we stand by the order of creation. And when we give up all of that in the admonitions of his apostle Paul, as he gives us those instructions, we pay the consequences of those sins as well. But the penalty for all of those mismanagement of his gifts was paid by Christ. And if we believe, confess, and trust that salvation is ours through Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit will carry us through time into eternity where we will be welcomed by all the saints into the eternal dwelling with God forever. This we believe. This is the hope in which we live in time, and it will be fulfilled because God keeps his promises. Amen. Amen.